Hello, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today, I want to talk about named arguments and emulating those and various interactions of language features. I'm going to start today in JavaScript, which does not have named arguments and can represent a number of other languages out there that also don't have named arguments, but there are ways to emulate them. My example here is a library that writes CSV files and or other types of delimited row and column data. So if it gets a number of rows, it will write each row, and for each value in the row, it can escape the contents in case, for example, the delimiter was included inside the cell content. So we have some data here, and we can run our application to see what comes out. Deno run named.js. By the way, Deno, this alternative JavaScript runtime, hit 1.0 this past week. I recommend taking a look at it, and maybe we'll give it a closer look in the future sometime. So we get what we expect here. We get our comma-separated values, and we get our values escaped if there's commas inside of them, or double quotes. The thing is, I might want to have various options that I add to my functions. And this is the kind of thing that happens a lot when you're programming. You write a function, and you think, oh, I want to have some additional options to go into here, so I'm going to add extra parameters so I can do that. For example, say I want to have a header row that's separate from my row of data. Then I'll need to add a new parameter on. And if I run it now, I get my header. Sweet. And think, oh, but what if I want to have tab separated values or other kinds of separators as well? Well, let's do that as well then. Let's make an option for a separator here that we'll use instead of our default. So we'll get rid of the default here and we'll pass the separator in everywhere. And now we have tab separated. The thing is, as you can see, we're on a slippery slope. I can imagine other options here, like using different types of quoting or entirely different dialects. Maybe I want to backslash to escape things or so on and so forth. And I can imagine this getting more and more features as it goes along and these functions having more and more parameters to take into them. And as I mentioned in my last video, I can't keep track of lists of more than two or three things at a time. So this is not sustainable. The question is, what's the path I'm going to take as a programmer? Is the easy path to keep adding more things onto my list, or is there another easy option that I might reach for instead? And to me, this issue of ergonomics is important in languages and editing environments. Happily, in JavaScript, there is an easy option. I can just put curly braces around things, and these become a destructured object. Put it around here, too. And rows, this is automatically the same as if I'd said, rows gets value rows. So I don't have to say that in JavaScript. I can, however, say separator is tab. And now it acts the same as before, except now these are named parameters going in instead of being positional ones. And it doesn't matter the order in which they're defined anymore. And I have better assurance as a programmer that I'm using my functions correctly. So the next thing is, though, is how does this relate when I move into TypeScript? And this is a difficult situation. So here I've got all the options available, but they're still currently positional parameters. So what we want to do is convert this into name parameters. And I could try doing this like so, except all of a sudden I have error messages everywhere up here. The issue is that there's a syntactic problem between specifying my types in TypeScript and features that exist in ECMAScript otherwise. For example, if I put a semicolon here followed by another identifier, this means I'm going to locally rename separator as sep, but to the outside, it's still called separator. And so because of that, we can't use this syntax for type indication in TypeScript. What I have to do instead is say, I'm going to destructure here. And then I can put my type in here separately. And this now works as long as I'm using it correctly at the bottom as well. However, that's a lot of overhead to be expected to do as a programmer. And so you get into a situation where you say, well, I know I could do this, but it's just so much effort, I won't get around to doing that. And I'll just keep adding new things onto my parameter list. You may or may not make the decision. These are the kinds of issues that affect programmers in their day-to-day -day programming that probably, if not explicitly, then implicitly affect the kinds of decisions they make. So the answer to this so far in TypeScript has been, it's going to be an editor problem and not a language problem to deal with. 
So in VS Code, for example, I can say convert parameters to destructured object. And it automatically did it on both sides here. And I didn't have to manually go through the effort of typing out the awkward syntax. And happily over here in Deno, we have an automatic formatter that can get this worked out better for me. So this is what I could have written by hand. And instead, I've had the editor create it for me. And therefore, maybe I'm more likely to reach for it because of that. Note that further, I can also extract a name type here as well. Rows options. Now, if I'm likely to have a sequence of functions calling functions calling functions and name parameters down the line, it might actually make sense to have had this defined as a structural type out in the first place instead of doing an ad hoc list of parameters. And so you could argue this is the right thing to do anyway. However, again, there's the issue of ergonomics and decision making as you go that sometimes happens a lot when we're programming. So how does this compare with an example language that actually has name parameters? Well, let's go to Python for this. So in this case, I've defined my right rows and right row and encode quoted as taking positional and or keyword only arguments. And I can pass in here right rows. Here's my header, rows, and separator. And because of the fact that Python has built in ideas of named parameters and has syntax for typing that doesn't get in the way of that, I can just simply write out the easy way of my name parameter header has type iterable, default value none. My separator parameter has type string, default value none, and so on, which was not easy to do in TypeScript. And so perhaps I might more easily reach for keyword only arguments in Python because of the convenience of it. On the other hand, if we said just like in TypeScript, maybe in the end it's right to make some separate structural type anyway so that it can be reused across a number of functions, it's harder to reach for that in Python. I could perhaps try to say I'm going to take keyword arguments and the keyword arguments of type rows options, except the truth is that people have not come to a consensus in the Python community on how you'd actually represent this to mean what I'm trying to say I'd want to mean here. And there's other consequences in terms of if I did wrap it all up together here, how do I then destructure it into convenient local variables? Because the only convenient destructuring to local variables that happens in Python through dictionaries is through named arguments. Not to say there's no way of solving these kinds of problems. It's just an issue that these are the kinds of things that you run against as you come into needs from various initial backgrounds in your programming language feature space. Let's see the same thing play out in C++ and Rust. Only different issues because different languages. In C++, we're going to pick up about where TypeScript left off, only I have a simpler example here to be able to demonstrate the features and issues easier. In saying where TypeScript left off, I mean that to do the equivalent of named parameters in C++, I'm going to use a named struct type. So I have two different versions of a function here, one that takes two parameters and one that takes a struct with those values contained inside of it. And this represents, again, a list of various options that may be passed to a function that could snowball into many more options in the future. I just have two here to make the example simpler. Then I can call the function by individual parameters, which of course in C++ could have options for default values. Or I can call the struct version, where not only is there the option for default values, but I don't need to specify the missing values either. In this case, I get the default default of an empty string, but I could give explicit default values in C++ as well. But in the end, this kind of call here and this kind of way of passing parameters looks not that different from what we saw in TypeScript or JavaScript. Let's run it and see how it goes. It does what we expect. Hi, space, dot, 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 or empty space there. Let's see how this compares with Rust. In Rust, we use a fairly similar method. We're going to have a structure with an A and a B. And again, just as for C++, this represents any number of uh, data option values that may come from any number of sources. And we have a function that either can take individual parameters or can take a structure. And I can call either the case of individual parameters or I can use a structure and give only the values I want to use. Note here a few differences between C++ and Rust. One is that I have to explicitly give my structure name in Rust, and there's pros and cons to that, but it makes it wordier at the moment. Secondarily, to get default values, I have to pass them in. Conveniently, this will pass any number of default values in for my missing fields. But again, it's a little more overhead syntactically and has its pros and cons. On the side of convenience for Rust, 
I can also destructure named values out of a struct, which isn't available in C++. This is very similar to the named destructuring we get in JavaScript or TypeScript. And just to emphasize that it's named and not positional, I put the two values out of order here. There's one other difference as well that I'll get to in a second after I try running this. The issue is that while function parameters in Rust are allowed to have elided lifetimes, or in other words, the compiler can infer the lifetimes in many common cases, that's not the case for struct definitions. There has been some discussion of lifetime elision in structs, but nothing currently has been implemented, and there's reasons for that, though they may implement it in the future. So I have to explicitly give lifetimes to my fields here so that Rust knows my intentions in order to be able to have references inside of my structure. So now let me try this again. And now it does what I expect and replicates the behavior we saw in C++. So these kinds of differences in terms of either convenience in passing values and default values and or convenience in destructuring values will possibly again influence programmer behavior. Without a nice empirical study, we can't tell. And even that's really difficult when it comes to programming languages because of so many confounding factors. Anyway, I hope this has been fun and maybe we can talk more about these kinds of issues again in the future. If you like the video, be sure to subscribe. Bye y'all.